Hi hey everyone. Uh, in this video I want to talk about coil springs. Uh, coil springs being extremely common. Um, you know, coil, squish it, provides a bounce back. Um, again, elastic energy storage device. Um, useful in, in all sorts of situations, need, you know, damping, elastic recovery, <clears throat> things like that. So when we talk about coil springs and, and our ability to analyze them, suppose we have, okay, that's a bad coil spring. I don't know how to draw a good coil spring though, so. We have a coil spring and let's have a little retaining retainer here and our force is applied to that and we'll define this outer diameter as D and a wire diameter as little d and if we assume that this force is, is uniformly distributed um, on this retainer so that it's applied evenly, you know, there's no offset. It's, it's right at the middle um, We can look at you know this spring and we'll We'll make a cut and just look at a portion of it. So let's say right here and we have a cross section that looks something like that now we have to translate this force that we apply to the spring to this new free body diagram so we can kind of figure out what's going on internal uh, to the spring. So for this to be balanced, we would expect there to be, you know, a force, and I'm just going to use the same notation here of F, uh, equivalently applied, so like a shear stress uh, or like a shear force over here. Uh, and then I need a moment, right? Um, but because of the orientation of our coil in that, you know, I'm looking at it and it's into or out of the board in this case, this gets represented as more like a torque. Uh, and it's going to be equal to F times half of the distance. So, so one radius of the outer, you know, overall diameter of the spring. This shear force um, ends up being, you know, relatively minor. Uh, in terms of what's actually happening. So really we only need to be thinking about this torque and taking this torque and turning it into a torsional stress using again our, our standard equation. And if I make some substitutions because I have a round cross section, I get something like that. Now it's in terms of um, torque and diameter and I've taken J out by substituting in the equation for a round cross section. Uh, and I can also substitute in what I just have for torque up here in terms of force. And I can get an equation in terms of the force applied. And this is just a, a, general, um, a general equation for the, the shear stress we would find in a torsion bar based on the force uh, applied to the spring in this case. Now, one place that we do have to be a little bit careful is that our equation slightly doesn't really apply completely to this scenario because the assumption with this with a torsion equation like this is that i have a straight um a straight beam a straight uh long axis of my my part and in reality, so if I just kind of, you know, draw a neutral, um, neutral axis this way and a cross section that I'm going to look at. And I, in general, I represent the torsional stress like this, right? I have uh, stress applied. Oops. Um, internal to this part and it's it's zero at the middle and goes out to some maximum at the outer edge and that's great right 
But in reality, now it's a little bit, I'm obviously going to exaggerate this in my drawing. I have a, a curved member because the coil spring is, is circular in shape. So I have a curved bar. So in reality, when I, when I look at how my stress is distributed, it's a little bit different, right? Because it's got to take into account that geometry. So what that means is, is out here somewhere my stress is greater than TR by J. And down here, you know, my negative stress or my opposite direction stress is greater than TR by J as well. So that's, it's not quite a perfect system to say we can just use that, that TR by J equation. So what we do instead is we make some adjustments and basically we, we factor in a correction. So first under static, uh, but also under fatigue, we have corrections and we'll look at both at the same time. So I start with my base uh, basic equation that I've already written. And that's the same in each case, of course. And now I'm going to multiply by a static correction factor or a fatigue correction factor. Uh, I'm just using the notation in the book here. And those factors look like this. And K sub W where C equals something we call the spring index which is a relationship between the outer diameter and the wire diameter, so a ratio there. So this is the spring index, which oftentimes you'll find springs um, defined by this, this spring index. Great, so now we have these correction factors, and what they're intending to do is correct for the fact that our um, shape of our rod that we're looking at in torsion is not straight as the normal TR by J equation suggests or, or, or assumes, uh, but has a slight curvature to it. And it factors in how tight that curvature is too, right? By the fact that we're in, uh, including the spring index, which accounts for uh, the diameter, the outer diameter, and the wire diameter. So both things are going to have an influence um, when, when it comes to uh, determining the stress. So this allows us to calculate the uh, torsional stress in our springs, you know, static or fatigue, you know, whatever our situation may be. One other concern that we have when we talk about springs is that they can take on a set. And you may have heard of this before. Um, generally, or, or basically what we're talking about is that, you know, they can, they can have plastic deformation. So deformation that isn't recovered, which means I've you know, compress them a bunch of times, maybe in fatigue, or I've overloaded them, you know, drastically one time uh, and, and cause them to take on a set. And that's something generally we want to avoid. So what we do is we can set a, a limit. We set a design limit and we can set it such that the, the, the stress in the spring, and I'll define this in just a second, is less than or equal to 0.35 somewhere in the range of 0 0.35 to 0 0.65 of the ultimate strength of the material, depending on what the material is um, and if there's any pre-setting. So sometimes in the design of our spring, we could, we could have the manufacturing process include a pre-setting, which um, makes it less likely that we would have problems with this down the road. This tau sub s is the stress at spring solid. 
So spring solid is, is basically exactly how it sounds. If I have a spring and I compress it all the way till all the coils touch, you know, and it effectively becomes a solid cylinder, that's as far as you can really deform it, right? I mean, obviously you can, you can plastically deform it um, when it's a solid cylinder as well, but while it's still a spring, we can compress it until those coils touch. And that's what we would consider to be uh, spring solid um, in that case. So that's a situation we want to avoid. Some more uh, definitions that can be useful um, to talk about or to know are spring deflection or is spring deflection. And deflection, we've defined, you know, deflection of, of things before, but um, basically just taking the equations that we have and then substituting all of the stuff that we've talked about in, I get 8FD to the third N over D to the fourth G. And here N is the number, oops, number of active turns. So what we mean by active is it's coils of the spring that are actually um, deforming, deflecting when we compress it. Um, usually our springs will have a coil or two at the top and at the bottom that are passive. They, they don't do anything. They're just, you know, making up the end of the spring um, and they might, you know, have a different um, different spacing because uh, of that's what because that's what they're doing so n uh, is the total number of active turns we can then define n sub t to be the total number of turns so including active and passive and generally speaking n sub t is equal to n plus 2 all right, uh, one more thing to define here is spring rate or spring constant, relation of force to deflection. And again, taking all the stuff we, we now know, I can substitute in or and rearrange this equation to get spring rate. So last thing, um, I really want to mention in this video is uh, one we can define the solid length length of the spring so this is again when it's compressed to solid uh, we have the solid length and what that is specifically somewhat depends on what the end of our spring looks like so if I have plain ends, which would be my spring comes over and then it's just cut, you know, perpendicular. Oops, drew that the wrong way. It's cut perpendicular uh, to the axis of the shaft. That's just called plain ends. Uh, and then my spring or my solid length is equal to NT plus one times D. If I have plain ground ends, oops, well, pretty close. So the end is ground to make it flat. Uh, we have LS equals N sub T D. If I have square ends, that is where it's cut square rather than uh, perpendicular to the axis of the spring. And in that case, L sub S equals again NT plus one times D. And finally, 
square ground. Something like that. Ls equals nt times d. Okay, so depending on which um, type of end I have on the spring, I would have a different um, calculation for what my solid length is. And, and that's fine. Now we can use that, um, you know, when we're specifying what we're doing. Um, generally, when we're designing a spring, um, there's, there's kind of a lot of variables that we might need to consider. So uh, one of the first things we might do is design um, the outer diameter, the, the overall size D, large D, and the wire diameter, small d, for whatever stress we're setting as our limit, you know, relation to um, trying to avoid a set. And uh, usually more than one combination of those two variables can be used to achieve the same thing. So we might need to limit it based on uh, the geometry of the application, you know, what our limitations are. Um, we can then design the number of turns based on the spring rate for what we're trying to do, uh, design the length of the spring to allow for um, some clash allowance. So usually we're trying to avoid that spring solid scenario, right? Because it's it's um, where the spring stops being a spring. Um, and we usually build in some sort of clash allowance there, which is effectively a safety factor. And after doing all that, if the design doesn't work, uh, then, you know, we can, um, if the design doesn't work, we can go back. We can go back, we can change uh, D um, the outer diameter and the wire diameter uh, to something else and try again um, and kind of iterate through that until we've come up with a, a good solution. Thanks.